and uh, we'd like to welcome all of you to be here. Now, tonight's talk, <clears throat> okay, uh, before we begin the talk, there are a few preliminaries. All the toilets on all the floors can be used. So if the toilets here are full, please feel free to move to level one or the ground floor. Okay, and all toilets are unisex. Okay. There are donation boxes on the sides here. One is labeled for Dharma Ram Buddhist Association. The other is for BJ Building Fund. So please feel free to empty your pockets before you leave. <laughs> and also, uh, we'll be passing around donation boxes for those who find it inconvenient to come to the donation boxes. So the boxes will come to you. <clears throat> and also, downstairs we have a lot of New Year cookies for made by our members for seal. So uh, feel free to bring them back. Uh, you put the money indicated on the on the cookies box to into the box there downstairs. Okay? And there are lots of books for free donation. Uh, please feel free to take it. Now uh let Reverend Hector is ready to come to the stage. Uh, so just do a brief introduction. The title for today's talk is 50 Years of Buddhism in the West. Buddhism for the modern mind. Remember Hung Shu, I think as all, all of you are probably have seen him before, holds a PhD and is a, ordained as a Buddhist monk in the Chinese Mahayana tradition under Master Suan Hua in California in 1976. Reverend was born in Toledo, Ohio, and he finished his Master's of Arts in Oriental Languages at the University of California, Berkeley where he met the late Chan Master Suan Hua. After receiving full ordination, he commenced the famous Three Steps, One Bow pilgrimage from uh, South Pasadena to Ukiah, a distance of over 600 miles over a period of two and a half years. During this time, he maintained a vow of silence, which he extended after the pilgrimage for a total of six years. Reverend is fluent in Mandarin, Chinese, French, and Japanese, and he regularly leads lectures, seminars, and retreats in a variety of venues on at least three continents a year. He holds a PhD in Graduate Theology, Theological Philosophy Union of Berkeley, and also serves as the president of both the Dhammaram Buddhist Association and the Buddhist Text Translation Society. Reverend is also the managing director of the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, professor of Dharma Ram Buddhist University, and a guest lecturer at the Bond University of Australia. He lectures worldwide on Buddhism, Buddhist text, translation, meditation, comparative religion, and interfaith dialogue. So we have a, Reverend is also known for composing songs and singing songs. So we brought the guitar along for him to sing. So after this, uh, hopefully Reverend sings some songs for us. So with that, uh, let us, uh, when Reverend comes in, kindly stand up and uh, give three bows to him. Okay.
I'll give you a line and you give me the line back. Namo tassa Bhagavato Paramato Sama Sambu Dasa Sama Sambu Dasa Listen Homage to the Blessed Homage to the Blessed Noble Noble And perfectly enlightened one And perfectly enlightened one Namo Sadanto Namo Sadanto Suchedoye Suchedoye Olahudi Samya Sambhutoshe. Samya Sambhutoshe. Okay, those of you who can join me. Wu Shan Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa. Hai Chen Huan Jie Nan Zhao Yi. Wo Jin Jian Wen De Shou Chi. Yan Jie Ru Lai Zhen Shi Yi. Okay, listen, I'll give you a line, you give it back. Supreme and wondrous Dharma. Subtle and profound. Rarely is encountered. Even in millions of eons. But now we see and hear it. And accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Sri Vashana and Goetia Shung, Venerable Master, Dhamma friends, good evening, welcome. Special greeting to the monastic Sangha who are here, my fellow Dharma friends. Greetings to Dr. Victor Wee. I have been a fan of the Wayfarers for 40 years. So I've known about uh, Buddhist Gem Fellowship through the work of Dr. Wee and, and his efforts in bringing the Buddhist teachings to music in Malaysia. Um, my name is Hung Shur. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Nice to be with you. Thank you so much for inviting me here to be with you at the Buddhist Gen Fellowship. I'm delighted to, uh, to be able to be with you all tonight. And we're going for two hours, is that right? A long time. Can you all sit down? <laughs> I hope so. so. Maybe the time will pass quickly. And I appreciate that there are people downstairs who are watching uh, on the uh, closed circuit TV on the overflow room. So hello everyone, thank you all for, for uh, being there. And you, that doesn't mean you can goof off down there, you know. You have to listen carefully as well. So. But it should be a pleasant experience, I hope. So, as uh, Bobby mentioned, I have been a Buddhist monk now for 42 years, and uh, that's a long time. I have also been to Malaysia, I think this is my 13th trip. I first came in, are you ready, all you young people, 1978. Uh, so, uh, tonight my understanding is English is the preferred language, but we will if we have better Chinese jokes, we'll tell the jokes in Chinese. So. Now, um, what I would like to talk about um, is the idea of, we, we talk about Buddhism for the modern mind, and we also talk about, uh, because I'm an American, born and bred, Toledo, Ohio, is where I grew up, and I first met Chinese in high school. My high school in Toledo was one of the three high schools that offered Mandarin Chinese as an elective. I thought my parents would say, what a waste of time. Why would you waste a class like that? They didn't. They said, you should take that class. It will broaden you. And since I was no good in science and math, I was good in, in language. So I took Chinese. And sure enough, boom, my local public library had a shelf of Asian religions, three books, total three books on the Asian religion shelf, but I read every one because they were published by Seton Hall University Press, bilingual, Zhong Ying Dui Zhang, Chinese English facing. And one was the Xiao Jing, one was the Dao De Jing, 
and one was the Liu Zhu Fa Bao Tan Jing. And when I picked up the Liu Zhu Fa Bao Tan Jing, I had this unusual, uncanny feeling that I had been talking to the Sixth Patriarch that morning on the phone. <laughs> and we had just hung up with each other. And I was like, how could this be so familiar? There was no way to explain it because I was an athlete. I was a four-season athlete. Baseball, basketball, football, and golf and tennis. You know? And I was the only one I knew who even looked at a Chinese character and tried to make it, you know, how does it work? So that was my beginning. In, uh, in anything Asian. And from then, there, I developed an interest in Dharma. So, anyway, uh, my uh, focus in Buddhism, we're going to go deeply into it tonight, but my, uh, my focus in Buddhism became, interestingly enough, a sutra, the words of the Buddha. And the sutra was the Da Fang Ayyanjin, the flower garden, the Avatamsaka Sutra, which I had no idea when I began uh, my study of Chinese. I started my study of Buddhism as a meditator, Sazen, Sazen, because that was the only Buddhism available in America at the time, in the 60s. So we'll, we'll go deeper into that. What I wanted to share tonight was this idea. So after, you know, I was raised Methodist. I was raised with a very different view of uh, the holy and the sacred. And it's only recently that I'm coming to see every religion as a story. What does that mean? It means somebody's mouth and my ears. Someone says, this is true, this is good, or this is truth, and this is the only good. Some people say it that way. Now, when you hear it, it depends on who you heard it from, whether or not you say, oh yes, that is my story too. So what's in the story? Well, there's the characters in the story, so-and-so does this and that. There's the storyline, these events happen. There's the understory of the values of the characters in the story and the storyline. What was important? What was unimportant? What was somebody willing to change their lives to protect, to absorb? To this is a story, right? Now, <coughs> Buddhism has a very compelling early story. The founding story is, we know, the prince, who, when he discovered that he was going to die, couldn't accept it. He challenged mortality. He set himself to answer the question, does everyone die? Is it inevitable? And sure enough, what he discovered was, there was a method. And what was that method? Well, it was cultivation of the Dharma. Right? So that's our founding story. And it's a good one. It's powerful. So powerful that 2,500 years later, that story still has juice for us. But what happens when that story leaves the culture where it was born? What happens when that story jumps a language? Or jumps an ocean? All right, that's, that's interesting. Can that story come alive for another generation? That's interesting, isn't it? So, I'm seeing lots of young faces tonight, and I'm happy to see that. And I know if they're young faces, chances are their parents are sitting right there, <laughs> hoping and so happy that their kids came tonight. Why are the kids here? They hope the monk will play the guitar. That's why the kids are here. We know that. So. <clears throat> and actually, Dr. Wee was kind enough to loan me his guitar. So what an honor to be able to play your Yamaha guitar. 
So parents want their kids to pick up the story. But what if the story can jump an ocean, but it can't jump a generation? Trouble. You remember, you were rebellious kids. Your parents' version of the Dharma probably is not your version of the Dharma. Guaranteed, your children's version of the Dharma is not your version of the Dharma. And I want to say, I have personally been bullied by the YBAM. I know how rebellious you guys were. You want to hear it? How interesting. I first came on my own without Master Shren to Malaysia in 1983. It was my third trip. We went to Penang, Wisma. I, I grew up knowing only the Chinese Mahayana. I didn't know anything other than that. Right? And do the Chinese Mahayana Tobo Chi Shu? We don't. Right? We don't. We, we sit down to eat. We don't go with our home. So we got to Penang Wisma Buddha Center, and YBAM was <laughs> flexing their muscles. And they said, We have arranged for you Tobo Chi Shi. We'll see you at, at 10 30. I'm talking to our other monks. <laughs> We said, well, thank you very much, but we, we're afraid we might do it wrong. So we, we're not familiar with it. We think we won't participate. YBAM boycotted all our events and told no one to come. So we talked to our Malpusa for one week. And we said, oh, boy, oh, boy. I guess there's a lot of anger towards Mahayana Sangha in Malaysia. How interesting. So my experience. So that's, I grew up, when I saw YBAM was part of Buddhist Gym Fellowship, I was like, Maybe <laughs> <laughs> So, now we know there are historical reasons for it, so it's not so simple, right? But, anyway, whose story do we listen to? And that answer is often, Depends on the generation. When 90% of the people spend their livelihood, spend their days growing food out of the ground, they have a very different story about, they have very different challenges, very different questions, than people who spend their livelihood typing at a keyboard. How many farmers do you know? Are there any farmers in the room? Downstairs, we can't see you downstairs, right? No, if this were 1890, probably half the room would be farmers or you left the farm to come to KL, right? In a short time, we have completely changed our orientation to where the power is. If we are farmers, where's the power? The weather. Right? If the rains come early, you have to get the crop in, or it will be, you work three nights, four nights, would not stop, and you bring in the crop. Right? So we have to learn the, the sweep of the seasons is part of our story. Who is the Buddha for someone who works by the sweat of their brow compared to the Buddha for someone who turns on the electric light, has to make time to market, coding, get it in, get the marketing lined up, and turns off the light when they're done. Day and night is a switch, not the sun. Different, different, isn't it? So, I'm an American. All of the Dharma that I learned, I learned from Master Shren Hua, a Chinese Buddhist monk from Manchuria, in San Francisco, California, USA. How interesting. Now, what, what uh, I was just over in, I was just in Taiwan, three weeks ago now, for a conference entitled Han Chuan Shu Jiao Dao Hai Wai Jin Bu, the Yan Bian. 
how has Han Chuan, Buddhism, that's my tradition, Mahayana, gone outside of China? And of course, there were reports from Vietnam, from Japan, from Korea. I reported in the West. And what's different about Master Shen Hua, he is not the only Chinese Buddhist monk to come to America. He is the only Chinese Buddhist monk in the West who made Westerners his audience. Okay, you get the difference? If you go to San Francisco and you don't speak any English, what do you do? You get Chinese-speaking disciples, you eat Chinese food with chopsticks, you do your ceremonies in Chinese. Because why would you do anything different, right? Master Shren Hua's vows were to bring the Dharma to the West, to Westerners. Now, who asked him to do that? courtesy of Feng Huang Television in China, they told the story of the connection between Master Empty Cloud. Anybody, how many people know the name of Xu Yin Lao A lot of hands, okay. So Master Empty Cloud, one of the most remarkable things about him was he lived to be 120 years old. And he ate vegetables. <laughs> no Big Macs. <laughs> And he was asked to go to America by Ananda Jennings, this unusual woman from Santa Barbara. And he said, I can't leave China, but I will send Master Shen Hua and two other monks to Kaishuang Fu Jiao Si Yuan to establish Buddhist monasteries and to bring the right Dharma into the Western Hemisphere. So that was the beginning of the, that was the, the cause, you could say, the motive of Master Shren Hua's coming to the West. Now, as I said, he didn't speak English, but he didn't stay in Chinatown. He traveled to the Mission District and to what was called the Tenderloin in San Francisco, which was a poor student uh, ghetto. He arranged to have a boarding house, and he rented out rooms to Westerners including a young man named Ron Epstein, who was the first Western disciple to take the three refuges from Master Hua. And in 1968, Master Hua moved, found a Taoist temple in Chinatown, set up the Buddhist lecture hall, Fu Jiao Jiang Tang, and did a 90-day Sharangama Sutra translation session. It was a summer session, three months of summer, at the end of which five Americans left home and became the very first American summer established on Western soil. All right, I was the third group. I came along, I left home in 1974, took refuge in 73, and then took the full precepts in 1976. So, okay. Who is the Buddha? Does the Buddha sit in half lotus elegantly, as our white 
actually a Buddha does here? Does, is the Buddha golden and sit up high with three Buddhas, Samrulai, as many Chinese monasteries would have him? So I was raised with the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not. Right? What? Thou shalt not have any graven images before me. How is that unclear? Thou shalt not. Right? It's pretty clear taboo, prohibit. So when I got to Gold Mountain Monastery and saw these golden Buddhas on the altar, I came in like this. <laughs> Don't zap me. <laughs> I am a jealous God. Okay, so that's, we'll remember that point for the future. So, okay. The question is, if you are told by your parents, you bow to this image, this is Lord Buddha, and the Holy Dharma, your parents are bigger than you are, you usually do it, but in your heart, how, how does that connect to your story? It's a question. I think every generation has to answer that for themselves. So you heard from Bobby that part of my practice as a young man was to do a pilgrimage at one point. I bowed from, I did a three steps, one bow pilgrimage. And I bowed from South Pasadena, which is in Los Angeles, through Chinatown, through a ghetto called Watts, to one Wilshire Boulevard, all the way down Wilshire Boulevard to where it ends at Santa Monica, to Highway 1, the Pacific Coast Highway, and we turned north. It took one month to get through Los Angeles. And we bowed up the Pacific Coast Highway for 800 miles, two and a half years, and I was silent during that time. But what was interesting was what Master Shen Hua told me to do. He said, you bow to an empty space Buddha. Bow to a Dharma realm Buddha, he said. You will disappear by bowing to all Buddhas in the ten directions. Those were his instructions to me. Now, why is that interesting? Because three steps one bow, you go one, two, three, and down, and up one, two, three, and down, down the sidewalk on Wilshire Boulevard, past the million dollar mile, Beverly Hills, right? Past UCLA, right? And the people who are watching go, so I'm bowing like this, they go. <laughs> Who are you bowing to? What, what are you doing that for? You know. So, how interesting. Introducing the Buddha to Westerners as an empty space Buddha. Why would Master Hua do that? That's interesting, isn't it? So, the question is, for us, who is the Buddha? This is in a country where there is no cultural Buddhist baggage. Clean slate, each on the Who's the Buddha? No clue. Mostly they think it's Maitreya, the fat Buddha. That's why they've seen that on the altar. Their uncle was in the Navy and he went to Hong Kong and brought it back, you know. He's fat and he's laughing. Oh, that's the Buddha. Yeah, he's, he's okay. Peace guy. Yeah. Happy, you know. That's. That's the image. They have no sense of, okay. So, following Master Shuen Hua to Malaysia, we're met at the airport by this layman. And I think the disciples here probably had him pick us up because he had a Mercedes. Whoever had the biggest car would go pick up the, the monks, right? Master Hua always drove Chevrolets. He never had a Mercedes. So this layman, is puts us in the car and I'm there. Oh, he's so proud. He's driving back from the airport, you know, and he think, he says, this is his chance. He says, 
Venerable sir, Master Juan leans forward on the seat in the back seat. He says, Venerable sir, I go to Brickfields. At Brickfields, one Buddha only. One Buddha only. Only one. But you, Mahayana, you say many, many Buddhas. I, sir, am confused. Is it one Buddha or many Buddhas? Master Kwan, I can see, he's, he's ready, you know, he leads forward, he says, no, I need you one more Shri for Shri Hauji for Shama. He says, you ask me, is it one Buddha or many Buddhas, is that right? Yes, yes, sir, yes. He says, do what I tell you, which one male for? Master Kwan says, according to me, I would say there are no Buddhas at all. I don't understand. Master Huang says, Sure, you'll dodge your way. There is only great wisdom in the driver's cycle. Very good answer. Very good answer. I'm happy. Right? So, that's a step in the direction to the empty space Buddha. So, how is Buddhism coming to the West? Let me suggest that, in, could I see the hands? Has anybody here been baptized? It's okay, you can answer. I have been baptized. <laughs> anybody else been baptized? Okay, you don't. Anybody downstairs been baptized? No. Okay. So, if you have been baptized, then that means you have been introduced to what's called a theistic system. What's a theistic system? A system where there is theos. Who is theos? A god. A divinity. A divine figure. Often a creator. Right? Uh, what is in Hinduism, we have what? Polytheism. Multiple gods. Shiva. Vishnu. Kali. Brahma. Brahma. Right? If you are part of Judaism, Part of Islam, if you're part of Christianity, monotheism, one God, only, only one. Okay, different systems. What are they? Different stories. All different stories, depending on what authority figure told you the story. That's your story, or it's not your story. All right. So, Master Hua came into a culture that is called pluralistic. Pluralistic means many religions together, right? America happens to be a, a pretty active religious society, so that on any given Sunday or Saturday or Friday, depending on your religion, people are in church, or the synagogue, or the mosque, or the monastery. When you come into a culture where there are competing divinities, competing gods, if you introduce the Buddha and put him on the altar and say, here's our god, people are going to go, oh, mm, very nice, it's not mine. They're out the door. They're not going to come in. If you say instead, here we study wisdom. Here we study wisdom. It's in these texts. Let's look at the texts. Here we study the mind. Here we study living beings, how to be a better person. People will go, well, that's interesting. What do you teach? And at least you've got their interest, right? So by day, Master Hua explained the, the classics of Confucius. Jia de Sixiang truly did. By night, he lectured Buddhist sutras. Without fail, every single night in America, 90 minutes, on Saturday, twice a day, noon and night. On Sunday, twice a day, noon and night, without fail, for 30 years. He explained sutras. As a result, the Buddhist Text Translation Society has many, many publications. But what's the point? The point is, 
Master Huang wanted the West to hear the Buddha's voice without the mediation of the commentaries. And that's key, right there. And he taught it without the Buddha being an obstacle, without the Buddha being another power figure. Many, many people who came to listen to the Dharma had left behind religions that had theos. Wounded Catholics, what's the story? When you come out, you're told you are broken. Original sin. You will never be whole or clean until, as the story goes, you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and his precious blood washes your sins clean. You have to buy the whole package before you are whole. Until then, you're broken. They say, original sin, that's the story. So children grow up being told in their story that they're not complete, right? Many, they're called wounded Catholics. There's a world full of them. They come to Buddhism, and the Buddha says, every single living being has the Buddha nature, all can become Buddhas. It's only because of false thinking and attachments that we don't know it. So get to work, clean off what covers your mind, and you have great wisdom. Cultivate. And people go, I'm home. <laughs> Thank you. So bow to an empty space Buddha. Bow to a Dharma realm Buddha. And if you think about it, now I, as you heard, I taught Buddhist Christian dialogue at UC Berkeley's seminary for 10 years. I have been part of the interfaith conversation since 1996. And I spend most of my day talking to non-Buddhists, interestingly, introducing from the grassroots. And of all those religions, I have to say, with few, few, few exceptions, Buddhism has a unique quality that I want everybody here to appreciate. Which is what? When you look for the source of wisdom, what direction do you look? I'll give you a clue. That direction. It's so different. It's so different from every theistic system where the power is out there. Right? So, I hear the, the Sri Lankan and Thai tradition that worships Lord Buddha. And I always have to translate it in my mind. Because Lord, in Christian language, there is, he's out there, you know. And I know that when we wake up, let's just use common ordinary language, when we wake up because of our cultivation, it's because we have uncovered what is inside waiting to be uncovered. Buddhism is unique in that regard. So, now, I've got to tell you my story. This is embarrassing. I better get a drink. <laughs> I was in Calgary, Alberta, at a monastery called Avatamsaka Monastery. And Master Hua had visited. He came up two or three times a year. And those were precious visits. And uh, Master Hua had been instructing me, translate, scolding me, for something I had done. It's a test to see if I get angry. And I was trying hard not to get angry. And I noticed that the pressure had pulled back a bit. And I looked up. And Sure, from looking at me like this. Said, How long have you been a monk? I said, ten years, Sherpa. He said, hmm, ten years. I don't think you have taken the first step inside the Buddha's book. I think that you still see the Buddha as a cop who is waiting to bust you if he catches you breaking the precepts. Am I right? And I was like, oh, Nicole, yeah. Why? 
an image crossed my mind, as Master Ma said that, of what I had done with the Buddha. I had an Old Testament God, an angry figure, male, hard, with the Buddha's face and a long white beard. I had created a hybrid Old Testament God with the Buddha's face. Master Hua let me soak in that for a minute, and then he said, I think you still don't understand how compassionate the Buddha really is. He's on your side. He's just waiting for you to wake up. And I nearly cried, because in my mind, I had truly painted the Buddha someone who was like a policeman, watching me break the precepts and catching me, and somehow, you know, it punishing, I didn't take it to punishment, but you still don't understand how compassionate the Buddha really is. He's on your side. He's waiting for you to wake up. Right? And Shrufa was just like, you know, it was. And a good teacher knows just when the student is ready. And he gives you that. You can't quite get there yourself. And you won't be the next step. Right? And what did I start to do at that point? I started to internalize the precepts. Holding the precepts because I saw them differently. And if our topic is 50 years of the Dharma in the West, Master Hua's audience were hippies. We came out of the 50s and 60s and 70s, and it was a time of great rebellion. The wayfarers were rebe rebelling against tradition <coughs> with their music and with their young people standing up. IBAM, strong, it's good. Right? We were rebelling against the Vietnam War. We were rebelling against civil rights and the abuses of racism in America. Women were beginning to stand up. It was that time. That was the 60s and 70s. So how different that time was. And as Master Paul was teaching us, he was dealing with people who misunderstood freedom. Right? That rebellion go, can go too far. The idea that don't fence me in, give me a rule, I will break it. That was kind of my credo. Right? How are you going to teach people like this about the precepts? Well, it took a while. What I understand now, this is, I think, the result of patient leap. And I have to tell you, what did Master Hua say about the West? He said it in Chinese. But he said, <laughs> he said, if you want to teach a rooster to lay eggs, that's hard to do, but you can still do it. Teaching Westerners is hard. You want to know what's hard, teaching or what. So he used ren, not ren, he used patience to teach us because we didn't know. What we knew was look for power outside. The story is determined you are passive, you are a sheep, that is the shepherd. It's a story that works for most of the world, right? The Christian story is a wonderful story. And my mother, for example, was a Christian to the end of her life. But it didn't work for me. I had a different tribe. My tribe was not camels and palm trees and deserts and burnt offerings on the altar. It was looking for the Tao. That's why when I picked up the Tao Te Ching, the English basin was like, oh my goodness. But I still hadn't translated the Buddha into a story that I could appreciate. Right? So here's how I understand the precepts. And this was when I started to actually take steps towards absorbing, integrating, 
taking charge of the responsibility for the Dharma was, excuse me, I want to cough into the microphone. It began by understanding that the Buddhas, let's just work with the five precepts, right? The five lay precepts. You all are familiar with them. That the precepts are not judgmental moral rules. The Buddha likes you if you hold the precepts. If you hold the precepts, you are purer than someone else. If you hold the precepts, you somehow get closer to the Buddha. Okay, I mean, you can say those things. That's not what I understand. The Buddha said, let's not quote the Buddha, let's look at what he did. He left a life of comfort to go into the palace, to, to, I'm sorry, to leave the palace and to go out and answer a question. Can mortality be beaten? Can I not die? Because he had never seen old age sickness and death. When he succeeded, he said, anyone who wants to follow me can do so, but watch out for five big mistakes that will knock you off the path. If you want to do what I did, you can. You can follow me, but don't kill. If you do, you will harm your own wisdom. You will obstruct, you'll break the mirror of your mind. And you'll have to repair it before you get past that. If you, you know, if you're sitting, if you meditate, and you've even gotten really, really angry at someone, you can't sit still. You feel like your gung has been burned. Right? Your forest of merit virtue. He said, be compassionate. Cherish life, foster life, don't take life, and you will succeed in your meditation. He said, if you want to do what I did, you can, but avoid stealing. Because if you deprive someone else of something that is rightfully theirs, you yourself will find yourself wanting, and you won't be able to sit still. It will obstruct your meditation. The same for three and four and intoxicants, right? Those precepts are what? They are pragmatic. They are for use, for success in cultivation. They are not judgments. They're not yardsticks of purity. They're not exclusive possessions of a certain class of people. Okay? They are for use. That's a new understanding. Right? Because why? I was a, an American who loved freedom, freedom at all costs. You can't fence me. If the Buddha catches me lying, he might not. Maybe I got away with it. Not. If we hold, take the precepts and hold them, where is, this, where is the ledger? Where is the scorecard kept? Right. Right, right here. So close, right? You can't fool anyone but ourselves. So that was a whole new understanding me was to realize that it was my play whether or not I held the precepts, whether or not I succeeded in meditation. So, okay, you have all been so patient listening to me talk, 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 talk. Time for us. And you know it. So if you, we have the cameras on, if you don't sing, we will know. <laughs> highly recommend that you see. It's a lovely veteran. It's been well played. Shows its age. Dignity. We've tuned it up. Okay, I have to tell you a story first. Why is a monk playing a guitar? 
what in the world? We just know that was my on the people. Okay, right, if we can slide it back so it's a little sturdy. I want to be right there. Got it? Crank it hard. There you go. That's good. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, one of the topics is that we can talk about that's enjoyable is Master Hua's expedient means. What kind of Fang Bian Fang did he use to teach Americans? My mother was sure that he was putting LSD in my teacup. Why else would I be bowing under the highway? So, people think of Master Shun Hua and go, oh, Shun Hong. Not a bit. Well, I can't say that either. But he used Tao Te, kindness, virtue. He said, in this culture, in this country, we do not talk about psychic powers. We talk about virtue. Truly so. So I wanted to leave home. It was 1974. I had already taken refuge. And I was going to move into the monastery. I was a UC Berkeley grad student. And I determined I was going to leave home. So I had three possessions left. I had a Nikromat camera that I had bought in Japan. I had a 1966 Volvo. That was the best year for Volvo, the Grace Sedan. And I had a guild guitar, a D40, that was my identity. It was also how I earned my living by singing folk music. It was a folk singer. Folk singer. Peter Paul and Mary. Bob Dylan, Judy Collins, John Baez. And uh, so I figured I had to get rid of all my positions. So the hardest one to part with was the guitar. So I thought, I've got to get rid of this guitar. So I put a, uh, I put a want ad in the San Francisco Chronicle. How many of you remember want ads? What's a want ad? You go to the newspaper, they charge you by the word, right? Remember, they typeset it? Come on, you're, you're all too young. <laughs> what do we do now? Craigslist, right? We did all, tap it out, Taobao, you know. A lot of I said, for sale, guild guitar, $300. It was worth $600. So, the morning that the ad was going to come out in the San Francisco Chronicle, I was waiting downstairs. Ring. Hello? Oh, not monster. Or John. Shervo? It's over from Mom. <laughs> what are you doing? I said, Shervo, I'm selling my guitar. Stupid. <laughs> Shervo? Stupid. <laughs> Shervo? He said, You're never going to be Chinese. You shouldn't try to be Chinese. You shouldn't try to use the methods that I use to teach Dharma. This is not China. You have to use the methods that work in your culture. Everything you have, you have to use it to teach the Dharma. In the future, in this country, a monk who can play the guitar would be very useful. <laughs> Okay, and my nature is such that I said, Sure, I want to leave home. I'm attached to my guitar. I have to sell it today. Stupid. <laughs> I disobeyed my first instructions from my teacher. Right? So, ring, hello, Gil guitar, $300. Don't sell it. I'm coming right over. You know, I sold my guitar and immediately regret it. 25 years, I did not touch a musical instrument. But then I saw uh, a teacher at our monastery in Berkeley on a Thursday night, uh, an American, also a folkie from New York. And he had 80 Americans, Vipassana meditators, singing along to a, a folk song. And I thought, wow, that's a good experience. So that's when I started playing guitar. So that's my excuse. <laughs> my story and I'm sticking to it. So every year, once, one time only per year, in the Mahayana tradition, we go 
天上天下无如佛，十方世界亦无比，世间所有我今见，一切无有如佛者。你们听得懂啊？是什么？哪一天呢？我的 ，right， 佛，这是是一佛节。The Buddha's birthday. We say, upon the earth, below the sky, the Buddha has no peer. In ten directions, everywhere, he is beyond compare. Okay. And then the second half is, I've searched around the whole wide world, and now I can declare you'll never find a wiser one than Buddha anywhere. I'm going to repeat that last line twice. But it was too short, so I added a bunch of verses in between. Right? But here we go. Ready? about the 
history here. Let's look at this one. This one, uh, let's see here. Um, 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 which one is We, uh, let's see, not that one. Uh, no, that's right. Okay. This guy. Yes, I found the guy. Here is Master Shen Huang. Notice in this photo there is one Asian face. <laughs> the one in the middle. <laughs> Everyone else in the photo is Caucasian. What an awesome bunch. What a scary looking bunch, right? Very <laughs> scary. This is Bhikshuni Hungshur. She is the senior monastic woman in the world, maybe. 50 years in the world. Uh, this is groups numbers one and two who have left home. This is my former college roommate, Bhikshu Hangyo, who actually introduced me to Gold Knight. So, this is a uh, historical photo. Kind of awesome, actually. Now, we recently, uh, in San Francisco last year, Master Hua was born in 1918, so we had a hundred years of centennial, bringing Dharma west. And, uh, of course, we had a chance to look at the whole sweep of Master Hua's life and uh, look back at the contributions that he made, this is the San, the San Francisco Public Library, it was very generous with us, it gave us space to put up a uh, major exhibit and, uh, on the third floor of the library, this whole display case area. So. But what I thought I might do is share with you some of the highlights of uh, what Master Shenhua valued as he, looking at the West, introduced the Buddhist teaching. And he was an educator as a kind of ministry. Mind you, he was also a cultivator, and he taught us the five schools in Mahayana. So Chan, and uh, Pure Land, and and also the Vinaya School, the teaching school, I mentioned how much he lectured, and then the secret school of mantras. Sangha Laity Training Program is our seminary. When we have a, a graduate of our Sangha Laity Training Program right here in the Gray Robes, this is Shramanera Chinliang, who left home at the advanced age of 71. Works harder than me, <laughs> so, this is the, the actual training for monastics, which is uh, part of, so that the Sangha is evergreen and fresh. Notice, if you will, Pali monks, that is to say, Thai monks from the forest tradition, Ajahn Chah, John Lawless, lineage. Master Hua insisted whenever we ordain, that we ordain with the three masters and seven certifiers, Theravada and Mahayana together. Fifteen times we have done so. Always there are monks from Sri Lankan tradition, Thai tradition, Vietnamese, Chinese, American now tradition. The Buddhist Text Translation Society is the publishing wing of the RBA, Dharma Buddhist Association. And let me take you out to the web and go to Buddhist Texts, two T's, BuddhistTexts.org, and you will find our website if anybody's curious. This is, we have uh, translations from Chinese, translations from Pali, from Sanskrit, and many different kinds of publications.
cookbooks. You all know that on Amazon.com, the number one category, number one best-selling category of books is cookbooks. <laughs> A lot of Chinese readers, I think. This, by the way, is my uh, letters that I wrote to Master Shen Pong during the pilgrimage, along with my colleague, Professor Verhoeven, Marty Verhoeven. Highway Dharma letters. Two Buddhist pilgrims write to their teacher. And this, this goes, this has gone into uh, a number of college classrooms. You can get it on your Kindle for 10 bucks. That's me. Okay, so Buddhist Text Translation Society. That's to say that's one of Master Hua's legacies. All of those sutras that he explained every single night without fail, we happily recorded and bit by bit translated. And now, interestingly enough, we are retranslating our prior translations. Uh, we were just in Singapore at the Jishulin, and we had a workshop on translation. And I was explaining to them Chinglish, <laughs> which is what? It's English words pasted on top of Chinese syntax. And you get a very interesting hybrid language. People go, I guess the Buddha didn't really speak English, did he? <laughs> and that's our failing, you know. And so now, translations that were published in the 80s, we are re-translating. Going over them again, smoothing it out. Realizing why? If you only know a certain amount of Buddha Dharma, if you only know a certain amount of Chinese, you try your best, you do what you can. And after absorbing it for 30 years and, and learning more and more Chinese, now we're all, yeah. So it's, uh, it's a, it is a long, steady process. As I mentioned, Master Hua was a lifelong educator. He started his first free school in Manchuria at age 16 and did all the teaching himself because he was a farm kid, couldn't afford a tutor. And this was in the last early years of the Minghua of the Republic. So he um, made it important that education be available to deserving students. And it is not Buddhist education, it's Buddhist inspired education. But Dharmaram Buddhist University is happily fully accredited by the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, WASC. It is the, the accrediting board, this is our second year uh, of staff retreats. Our, um, the accrediting board uh, sees our program as now holding the flag for the humanities, because all of you educators know about STEM, right? They're just getting money. And humanities are disappearing. Foreign languages are disappearing. Classics are disappearing. So our educational program is based upon the great books of the West and of the East. And our program, uh, students study with a cohort. You enter and you study with the same group of people, every subject through your, your four years of undergraduate or two years of, of graduate education. And the role of the faculty member is facilitator and coordinator, not source of knowledge, right? Everyone reads the same books together. The facilitator talks about them. What ideas arose here? What does that do to your conceptions that you've been carrying before you read in? So, Dharmaram Buddhist University, please do investigate DRB. Radically free, radically responsible. Right? Complete freedom entails responsibility if, you're, if you hope to be an educated person. Now, look at some of the activities of Dharmaram Buddhist University. Who is this individual? That's Bhikkhu Bodhi, the primary translator of Polytext, editor of the Polytext Translation Society of Ceylon. Right? He's coming to DRBU this year for a two-week series in Abhidharma. How about that? 
We uh, also practice as well as study, it's the line in session. Um, and I will say, here, freedom is the goal of the liberal education. We do have fellowships and scholarship money for deserving students. So if you are interested, you want to go to drbu.edu. This is a shameless plug, isn't it? Dharma Buddhist University. Buddhist texts. Buddhist texts. Dot org. Okay, so this is clearly, oops, come back here. Uh, education was one of Master Hua's uh, ministries, one of his legacies. So this is how the Buddhist teaching is progressing in the West. Dharma, Dharma. Buddhist University and Buddhist Text Translation Society. Okay. DRBU.edu and Buddhist Texts. Okay, now what else? This is, we're actually kind of proud of this website. It's got a lot of stuff. One of our students' graduation, his commencement speech, Why Bother Meditating, from a professor. Alumni uh, highlights. So, yeah. Okay, what else here? Um, this is our educational outreach for people who don't want to enroll in a four-year program but still want access to the ideas of the Dharma. The RBU Extension. Here's Bhikkhu Bodhi talking to the lifelong learning, the elders, Shurangama Sutra Summer Retreat, Guanyin Recitation, uh, Irigare meets Nagarjuna. Anybody into French feminist theologians? Talking to Majamika. That's quite fascinating. Living the Practice, two month immersion, adulting in the Dharma. Who's a good role model for growing up? Right? And these are our elementary and secondary schools. I think, could I see the hands of those of you who have graduated or have taken part in the school? Anybody here? One hand, one brave hand. A few others. These are, what, this is interesting because, as I said, Master Hua, taught us the Confucian classics by day and the Buddhist sutras by night. What was the goal of, what was the first curriculum element for the elementary school is filiality. Xiao Shun. Xiao Dao, right? filiality. Which we do not interpret as obey me. We interpret it as recognize the kindness given to you and think to repay. Striving to repay the kindness of parents, elders, teachers, of donors, of the planet, of the country. Right? Find a way to repay that. Now, we'll talk about that in just a minute. Here's our boys, here's our Bo Yue Tuan, our traditional Chinese instrument orchestra. You ever see a, what is that, about a nine-year-old meditating? Do you, do you have meditation for kids? Right? And the girls' school. Girls' school is outstanding. We have uh, a superintendent of education in the Ukiah Valley in California. He sends his children to our schools. The Chao Bukam sends his kids to our schools, not his own public schools, because we separate the boys and girls, and no video games. You're going to get me there, man. I don't know. So, what about the fourth? So we have what? Ministries, legacies. We have setting up the Sangha, explaining what it means to be a Buddhist, who is the Buddha. Two, 
translating sutras, explaining the Buddha's voice, letting the Buddha's voice be heard. Three, education. Starting with filiality, connecting to our roots as humans. And then four is interfaith. Now let me say a word about who is the Buddha. This is how Master Hua explained the Buddha starting with the schools. He said, Xue Fu Zuoren, Yue Dao Jin Fu Dao He said, we learn about the Buddha, but we practice being people. When we can become perfected human beings to the ultimate point, just that is Buddha. Who is the Buddha? He's a perfected human being. In our tradition, we translate the Buddha as one, the Bei, someone who is perfected in all the possible virtues, which means his nature has been unconquered. All of the attachments, all of the ignorance, all of the emotions, all of the wrong views, all of the afflictions, klesha, have been scraped away so those virtues shine. It's a human who has been perfect. Now, it's interesting that Americans go for this because it's very democratic, it's very impartial, it's very fair, and the authority is in me, right? I do it myself. If you think of it this way, what do we have in our society already that resembles this description of the Buddha. They say, right? The teacher brings you to the door, but you yourself have to go through. Who do we have in our society who's like that? A coach. Think about it. Right? It's a very American description of the Buddha, right? A coach. What does the coach do? The coach says, okay, team. Now, uh, just like we did it in practice, we got to get up there. We're going to go, go, go. Just use those plays that I taught you and, you know, try your best. Oh, oh, okay, that's all right, that's all right. We'll pick him up, pick him up. He'll be all right. Come on back here. Come on here, take a drink. Okay, get back out there and go, go, go. All right. Oh, you scored. Wonderful. Good for you. Excellent. Right? He doesn't carry the ball. He teaches you how and encourages you to go and do it. That's interesting, isn't it? That the Buddha is there helping us become the best possible person that we can be through cultivating our virtue. He's called a coach. So, now, that kind of, that's a very different approach. What I think that is, that's a story for our digital generation that people can approach. If we push Lord Buddha on Westerners, you don't want him. If we interpret the Buddha as a coach, someone who is there to helping you understand how to get through your problems, an empty space Buddha who is there helping you understand your life, they'll go, oh, that's interesting, I might try that. So, different story for a different generation. You can explain the old story, but if people don't pick it up, it's not their story. Right? So, interesting, interesting. Now, what am I telling you? Buddhism in the West, in the last 50 years. But the West is not a place. The West is a state of mind. Once these things become universal, there is no North, South, East, West. Right? Okay. Why did Master Huang teach us filiality as much as he taught us prajna. Every Thursday night at the Berkeley Buddhist Monastery, I already mentioned, we have these 80 Westerners who come in to do vipassana. Right? They're part of Spirit Rock, which is Jack Cornfield. Maybe you've seen his books. He was a, a monk in Ajahn Chah's tradition, returned to lay life, took all of the devotion out of vipassana sitting, but kept <coughs> kept the meditation and the psychology. Very, very successful. So, he, his group in the East Bay is now called the East Bay Inside Meditation Center. 
They come every Thursday night. The teacher is in the East Bay, is called James Barrett. And James had to go away on retreat for two weeks. He asked me to teach. He asked me to fill in. This is an American story. Happy to share it with you tonight. First night, my uh, two nights, I say, okay, uh, I gotta, got some homework for you. I'm like, homework. I want you, after class, to go back to your house, your neighborhood, your circle, and find a significant elder not a significant other, you have those. Find a significant elder, an old person, could be your parents, could be your grandparents, could be somebody else's parents who are lonely, or some grandparents, could be somebody in your condominium down the street, and spend some time with them. Not once, once is easy, do it twice. And here's what I suggest. Go to them and say, you know, I've been meditating now, and uh, I realize that I'm aging, and uh, you're further down the road than I am. You have so much wisdom, so much experience. Could you tell me a little bit about how things look from where you are now? Start there. And if that old person does not say, oh, come in, come in, I've got cookies here, I would love to tell you. If they don't say that, they are very lonely elders. So just try it. And then next week come back and we'll talk about it. All right? And they're going, what does this have to do with meditation? <laughs> okay. You said so. So, came back the next week. And, oh, okay. Well, who wants to be first telling us what happened? Not a hand. Eighty people. Well, okay, uh, who's got a story to share? Not a hand. Well, did anybody do it? Dharma Master, we don't have any elders in our lives. <laughs> I kind of thought so, but did anybody do it? So this woman named Sumaya, who's a regular, she says, yes, yes, I did. Most amazing thing. She said, you know me. And I said, yeah, we do. She said, I've been meditating now for about four years at this group, never misses a Thursday. She said, but what you don't know about me is I broke up with my mother. I'm emancipated, she said. My mother had a song that she used to sing to me, and I just got tired of it. She used to say, you know what's wrong with you? I'll tell you what's wrong with you. Everything is wrong with you. It's your shoes, it's your dress, your shoes too short, that's too big. And I just got sick of it. I couldn't stand it anymore. And so I said, Mom, I'm done. You know, and I left her. And I haven't really thought about her much in five years. And she said, but something, you know, I've been meditating. And when you gave us that assignment, it just... So I did. I, I went to find her phone number. And I had it back in the back of the drawer. Kind of slipped to the back of the drawer and I pulled it out. And I... There's, I called my mother on the phone. What do you think she did? First time she heard, Sumaya, you know what's wrong with you? I'll tell you what's wrong with you. You never called me. That's what's wrong with you. And I said, Mom, you're so cute. You never change. I'm going to come see you. Dead silence on the phone. What do you mean? I said, Mom. So she, she Sumaya said, so I walked the five blocks to her house. <laughs> and when she opened the door, she was smaller than I remembered. I looked at my mother. She said, you know what's wrong with you? You know what's wrong with me? I, said, I, I gave her a hug, and I sat down, and we ate cookies and drank tea. I decided to move in with her. And everybody in the room was like, <gasps> She said, but here's the strangest thing of all. The next day when I meditated, my whole chest was warm, starting with my heart. I had no idea that by 
cutting away from my mother, I turned my chest into a block of ice. And as soon as I gave my mother a hug and brought her back into my life, I was like, mm -hmm. <laughs> and my chest was warm. She said, who knew that when we leave our parents, we cut our own roots. And I'm like, <laughs> right. So I said, anybody else? And it was John. And John is this guy who's got a big beard and kind of guy. And he's an inspector, a building inspector for the city of Oakland. And John doesn't talk very much. But he said, oh, I, 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 I want to tell you what happened to me. He says, John. He says, my father, my father is a funny guy. My dad is one of those guys, he used to you know California, a doomsday cult. He actually believed in one of those preachers who said the world is going to end, and they had the date, and they had the time, and he was, he really believed it, and he gathered with a group of people on the beach, and waited, because the sun was not going to rise that day, right? and they were going to fall, and he said, guess what? Sun rose just as usual. <laughs> My father was crushed. He was crushed. He completely believed in that. And he just, he didn't know what to do. And so he moved down to Bakersfield, down to the edge of the desert. And he just sat in a dark room, kind of watched outside the window. We knew about it, but he didn't want to talk to him. So he said, so you, Dharma Master, you gave us this assignment. And he said, I knew the time had come. Got in my car last week and I drove down to Bakersfield and I knocked on the door. And what do you think? This voice from inside said, John, is that you? I said, Dad, how did you know? He said, I had a feeling. So I walked in and my dad and I meditated together. Now he didn't say, and we're moving in together. Everybody was waiting. For him. He didn't say that. He said, but it was so nice to be back with my dad after so long. He said, thank you for telling us about, what do you call it? Filiality, is that what you call it? Thank you for that. We need that. He said, so there's Master Law's expedient, right? But clearly, it is not king wo or hua, wu ni wu xiao. It's not that kind of filiality, right? It's not li peng on, you know, on the guangchang, you know. Do so, not that. So it's what true um, oh, understanding that to become people, it is not our work. We are standing on the blessings of our parents and of our founders and of our teachers and of the Buddha. So to connect to our roots, we think to continue the energy keep it moving to pay it back. And if you have your parents alive, they might be in the room, what a blessing you have to be able to actually warm up your heart. Right? It's the same groundwater that feeds all the different kinds of trees. All their roots go down. As long as they go down, you can still keep your individuality. You can still keep your personality but you are being fed by those roots. And when it goes the other way, guess what? Every living thing is drinking from that same water, and we become something called tong ti da wei. Same body, great compassion. It's the same groundwater that feeds all beings equally. And if we have stepped away from our connection to our parents, our roots are not being nourished. So, what is the connection between filiality and, mind you, piety, P-I-E-T-Y, big red X. <laughs> Not filial piety, mistranslation. Filial respect. Piety is something nobody wants. Bad translation. Retranslate that. Piety is pinched and skinny and moony. <laughs> piety. No, 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 that's, filiality is like, Another one, who is Guanyin Bodhisattva? In English, Guanyin Bodhisattva is 
in English. The goddess of mercy. No. Rex. <laughs> Ask a hundred people, a hundred people will tell you goddess of mercy, right? Guan Yin Bodhisattva is not a goddess. She is not a Tian Yun. Goddesses are Tian Yun, right? She is not merciful. She's compassionate. It's different. Compassion is Tong Tu, same body, no difference. Mercy is, oh, please don't hurt me. You know, there's a difference in power. So, Goddess of Mercy, it's one of those unfortunate lexicons that's completely already absorbed. Filial piety and the Goddess of Mercy. See what we're fighting against, right? Nobody wants Chinese culture, Dharma wisdom, because it's couched in unhappy language. So. I'm a translator, and that stuff gets me, it bugs me, right? So I, okay. Ready for one more. You're all being so patient with me, thank you. How do we spread the Dharma in the West? We have to tell the story in a way that makes sense to people before it becomes their story. Right? That's the goal. We want our own children, our own spouses, to be able to warm up and say, oh, there's goodness in the Dharma. There is juice and energy there that benefits my life. So, She had been lied to. She had been told that everything was young and eternally green. May you be forever young, says Bob Dylan. Right? So, it was not true. It was a deception. It was an illusion so that she wouldn't catch on to impermanence. Well, the prince did her. Went out, well, there's charioteer, you know the story. That's our family story. It's a really good one, you know. Because suddenly he saw old age, sickness, death, and then the fourth messenger, a monk, looking like Xun He Shi, or like Fa Guang Ba Shi, or like Qin Xiu Shi, even like Qin Qin Liang. People look at him and think, "Wow, oh, I could do that too." Seventy-one, can I leave all? And the wives are saying, "Take him, take him." <laughs> we'll see. Anyway, and with that fourth messenger, he said, huh? So, take a look. Prince Siddhartha had a wife. He loved her like he loved life. She was fine, she was fair, but he knew he had to go. When he said goodbye, he said to her, Yashodara, look at where life leads. Yashodara, I'm going to try to get free. I took a little trip into town. I learned that death will cut us down. I woke up by the city wall. Guess what? Freedom to die, that's no freedom at all. How is that freedom? Yashodara, look at where life leads. Yashodara, I'm going to try to get free. Then he says to his wife, the princess, she's sleeping and she's pregnant. She doesn't know he's about to go. Like you, I never heard no man sigh. I never knew that people died. I never heard a sick man moan. But today I learned this body is my home. Now, power line coming up. Songwriters will appreciate this line. Yashodara, death is haunting me. Yashodara, love won't set us free. Now that is countercultural, right? In a world where God's love is the greatest good. The Buddha said, love, no, we'll still die all the same. It'll hurt more if you can't let go. Now, here's the turn. Then I saw another man who walked in robes with bowl in hand, his gaze looking to left and right. His brow was clear, his eyes were bright. I asked him what he did all day. He said, I cultivate the way. I watch my mind, I watch my breath, and in the end, it's not a death, it's not a joke. You die and you go, right? 
No. You showed her up. I couldn't love you more. You showed her up. That's why I'm walking out this door. He's doing it for her because he knows that usually the men die first. A lot of lonely widows. And if he goes and she's still around, what, what's that? I'm going to try to get free. Some will say I'm a fool. Some will say I'm too cruel. The best thing I can do, because when I get free, I'm coming back for you. He showed her, look at me like this. And he did. She became a nun. His son became a monk. He was his father's pallbearer. Right? Filial. Filial son. The Buddha, the prince. <coughs> Here we go. Prince Siddhartha had a wife. He loved her like he loved life. She was fine and she was fair. And when he said goodbye, he said to her, You show me up. Look at where life leads. You show me up. I'm going to try to get free. I took a little trip into town, I learned that death will cut us down. I woke up by the city wall, freedom to die is no freedom at all. You show the road, look at where life leads, you show the road. I'm going to try to get free. Like you, I never heard an old man sigh. I never knew that people die. I never heard a sick man moan. Today I learned this body ain't my own. You show me Death is haunting me. You show me Love won't set us free. Highly controversial line there. Then I saw another man who walked in robes with bowl in hand. His case looked neither left nor right. His brow was clear, his eyes were bright. I asked him what he did all day. He said, I cultivate the way. I wash my mind, I wash my breath, and in the end it's life and death. You show the road. I couldn't love you more. You showed her up. That's why I'm walking out this door. Now, some will say that I'm a fool, and some will say that I'm too cruel. This is the best thing I can do. I get free, I'll come back for you. You show me up. Look at where life leads. You show me up. I'm going to try to get free. And, and just throw money, that's all right. <laughs> You know the the Kuali singers, the Kuali singers, and that's what they do. Actually, don't go too far away. I got you. Um, so, one thing that I wanted to share about setting down the baggage of the past in a new land. We can do it in America because there wasn't anything to begin with. It's harder in a place where Buddhism has been for thousands of years. It's very hard. It's maybe impossible to really change the course of an ocean liner. You can only go a little bit. And in Malaysia, we know what, what the Buddhist churches have established. And for better or for worse, it's really hard to change. But not so in the West. So one of the things that we cherish is our relationship with the Theravada monks. 
of the Thai forest tradition, Ajahn Shah. We take a look here. This is called Monks in the West. Not only do we unite with our Theravada brothers, but also with Benedictine and Trappist Catholics, monks in the West. This is a very healthy dialogue that has been trialogue that has been going on with the Vatican's permission for years now. Check out the color of the robes. Isn't that brilliant? These are Trappists. The, the white is the Trappists, the black are the Benedictines. Welcoming them. This is at Gethsemane Abbey. Anybody read Thomas Burton? Seven story, uh, seven story city, seven story castle, uh, seven story mountain. This is in the, the uh, monks doing Catholic mass in the Buddha Hall, the city of 10,000 Buddhas. Right? So, this is the Parliament of World's Religions. There have been six in the world. And we joined together, we took uh, 60 of our students and friends, including monks from China, to Salt Lake City for the parliament. Um, this is the Western Buddhist monastic gathering. We set down the baggage and meet together. Notice the colors of the robes here, right? Check. Here's two and children. She was here not long ago. Shravasti Abbey. Um, and the good news here, African American monks, African American nuns, the good news is that we can. We can set down the baggage, the old ways of saying, Shall <laughs> Trump, right? And just say, We're starting fresh. That's not the Buddha's intent that we should be at each other's throats or insult each other or do anything other than put our palms together and celebrate the Dharma. And then, as a Buddhist body, go talk to other religions. It's the only way it can be genuine. So, people know that California, and like Australia, Australia is much worse, California has been plagued by wildfires. It's been very dry. We've had three years of drought. And we in Northern California are at ground zero for the wildfires on all sides of us. Master Shrema knew that Ajahn Sumedho was looking for a piece of land to establish his first American branch. In England, it's Amaravati. Um, in Thailand is Wat Pahong, Wat Pananacha. So Master Hua said, Ajahn Sumedho, I have 120 acres of Mendocino County mountainside. It needs monks. Would you like this piece of land? Ajahn Sumedho said, yes, I would. <laughs> That's a pretty good invitation. <laughs> he was happy. And Ambayagiri, Forest Monastery was created in Wei Shan, Fearless Mountain. So they have been our Dharma friends ever since. And uh, we visit them, they visit us regularly. So um, we ordained our, our monks together. So um, two years ago, now it was, 19, it was uh, 2017, the monks woke up in the morning to the sound of klaxon horns. There, to get to their monastery, up by Giri, you have to go way, way out. The road becomes two lanes, then one lane, and then there's the monastery, way out. But all the neighbors in the mountains, this is called Redwood Valley, is the closest little town. They notify each other that something's going on with air horns, you know. Those air horns. And so they heard the air horns going off came out of their kutis on the mountainside, and the sky was red. There was a major forest fire coming. It took the town of Santa Rosa, if you remember, two years ago. And uh, so 22 people in the monastery, and they had seven vehicles. Two of them were Priuses, very low. They're not country cars. And the neighbors had come up and 
and run the klaxon horns to say, do not try to go out West Road. The fire has dropped trees and power lines. It's impassable. You can't get through it. Go the other way. Well, the other way is this two-lane rutted road that goes over creeks, seven creek crossings, and they have to go past the neighbors. Who is the neighbor? The neighbor is Mount Tabor, Ukrainian Catholic monastics. Right next door to Abayagiri is a Catholic monastery. Father Damien is their teacher. He's a wonderful monk. And they're Dharma friends. Right? And uh, we, they, they study with each other. And we're all in a neighborhood of monastics. So they have to get out. And two of their cars won't go because they have to go over the rutted road. So they find some lay disciples show up with pickup trucks. So Ante jump in and they go out the back way, past Mount Tabor, and into the town of Willits, where they find some refuge. Well, we called the next morning, said, how it, you know, did you make it through? And they said, well, we were homeless again, really homeless. And they had just built this brand new multi-purpose hall that cost them millions, and it was, they didn't know. So we said, come to live at City of 10,000 Buddhas. So 22 monastics came to City of 10,000 Buddhas, two lay people with them. They stayed for a week. And the two communities just blend like milk and water. And every day, the fire marshal says, has a meeting in the town of Ukiah and says, can I go back in? Can I go back in? The fire has progressed here, progressed here, da, 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 da. So after a week, and we, we used uh, their satellites that show heat sensing, right? And Abayagiri was this little green dot surrounded by red. And we went. And so fire marshal says, okay, you can go back. We can't promise anything, but at least you can go back. So the car caravan left the city of 10,000 Buddhas and went down. And on both sides, all the vineyards, this is wine country. All the vineyards, black, ash, just ash, you know, and all these houses, just ashes, nothing, just these chimneys, piles of bricks, like that, nothing else. You know. Truly, it looked like the devastation after a bomb had gone. And we go in, and looking worse and worse, and we come around the corner to the parking lot of Abayagiri, and here are all the Cal Fire firefighting equipment in the parking lot. Here are the bulldozers, right? Here are the big, big trucks. And here are the, uh, <clears throat> the pumpers. And, and here come the firemen. And the firefighters, a lot of them are Apache Indians from Arizona. They love to test their strength against the fire. <laughs> and they go, oh, is this your place? You live here? Man, we wanted to meet you. We've never seen anything like this. All these years, we have never seen a forest reject the fire. We couldn't believe it. The fire went right up to the edge of your property and stopped. Who are you guys? <laughs> Whatever you're doing, you keep doing it. They said, right? In the most right. Lining up, and to this side of the, the boundary of, of Abayagiri, black ash. Here, you can reach out and touch it, is a shrine to Ajahn Chah made of wood, no dust on it. Here's the brand new multi purpose hall, no ashes even. Unburned, untouched by the flames. The flames on every side went right up to it and stopped. It's, if we had the time, I would show you the photographs. Go to abayagiri.org if you want to see this. You have to go back, because they post photos all the time. I'll show you. Go to, here we go. Abayagiri.org. You have to go back two years. Abayagiri.org. And so, we were like amazed that 
nothing had been harmed. And Father Damien was there. Father Damien said, amazing. Mount Tabor, nothing was harmed. Untouched. However, next door, on the other side of Abaiguri, a Thai monk from Bangkok heard that Abaiguri was there, Ajahn Chah's, he wanted to chie guang a little bit, right? And what did he do? He bought land and put a monastery there, except no monks, no cultivation going on there. Just a caretaker. He went back to Bangkok, burned to the ground. The Buddha images all that. The conclusion is, wherever people actually cultivate the way, gets protection. We saw it with our eyes. Even though you call it a Buddhist place, if nobody is there actually turning the Dharma wheel, actually removing the coverings from their nature, actually practicing kindness, compassion, serenity, joy, no protection. So, where people are cultivating, Christian or Buddhist alike, the devas and the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas pay attention. That includes her house. So, the conclusion that we came to is California is probably going to burn. So far we've avoided direct flames. We have to make fireproof people. <laughs> and you start by not letting yourself get angry. Master Shunhua gave us a mantra. It's called the Patience Mantra. How does it go? It goes like this. English, the first English language mantra. It goes, patience, patience, gotta have patience. Don't get angry, so full. <laughs> really works. You ready? Patience. 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 Gotta have patience. Gotta have patience. Don't, get angry. Don't get angry. So ho ho. Well then. Practice that on your spouse. <laughs> and you're just about to, uh, you know, patient those fashers and patience, patience, gotta have patience, don't get angry. What was that last word? Uh, so forth. <laughs> Svaha, Sanskrit means may all things be auspicious. Ready? Here we go together. Patience, patience, gotta have patience, don't get angry. So forth. It really works. Just say it until the fire goes away. Alrighty, so we've heard a little bit about Master Hua in the West. We heard about 50 years of the Dharma uh, being stories. Every religion is a story. In our tradition, we have the Pure Land. The Pure Land, the Buddha sat down and said, hey, you don't know about this. There was a monk who made a Pure Land. Recite his name, you can go, totally a story, right? The question is, is it your story? Can you connect to it? I think different generations need different stories. So, how is Buddhist Gem Fellowship doing in communicating our story to young people? Maybe they need a new story, a new casting of the same principles. Kindness, compassion, serenity, joy, right? How do we do that? How do we get them to look at wisdom? Where is the teaching? It's here. Where is the power? It's here, not out there. Theistic religions put the power outside us. Maybe in these images, no. Look within. Buddhism's unique quality is the direction where we look for the power. Right? We look within. And the Buddha, interestingly enough, although it sounds almost sacrilegious, the Buddha becomes something like a coach. Encouraging us, teaching us how to take the ball down the field. But we have to do it. He's there showing us how, encouraging us how, saying, do it the way I did. Follow the precepts because they will get you there without obstruction. They are pragmatic. They are for use. Right? They're not a judgment on you. You're pure. Right? Oh, oh, Siri is talking to him. So, I wonder what word could her. Precepts? Here we go. Precepts, Siri? I am following the precepts. Thank you. <laughs> I have a good iPad. 
So that's kind of how you know, teaching in our Master Pond gave us rules for the Sangha. What does it mean to be a monk? Defining the Buddha for a new generation. He taught us translation. He said, let the Buddha's voice be heard. Commentaries are great, but they don't replace the Buddha's voice. Our wisdom is enough. It is not the case that if you translate a word wrong, you will fall into the hells. That is not the case. Right? If you see the Buddha, he's going, ha, I caught another one, yeah! <laughs> no, that rule was made by people who don't want to translate sutras. So, no, it's not, there's no risk in translating sutras. Okay. So, he also gave us education, Dharma University University, and he taught us interfaith to integrate in the world. We, don't, we can let that baggage go. Why do we have to honor those stupid ways of relating? Right? If they obstruct us. Okay, um, we have time for one more song, which is a dedication of merit, which is actually in Chinese it was Jenny Tsu Gong that one, right? But um, we have done it in English now. And notice, uh, I, I just was co written. Lorena McKennett is a marvelous Canadian Celtic songwriter, singer songwriter. She's pretty much uh, aged now. But we used her song, which is the, it was written for St. John of the Cross, the Dark Knight of the Soul, San Juan de la Cruz. And I borrowed her melody. She was kind enough to allow us to do that. And uh, the deal is that we have to make a wish. This is interactive. And the dedication, what do we have in, in Pali? May the goodness that arises from my practice and from this act of sharing, may all desires and attachment quickly cease. You know, this is the Pali transversal merit. In Mahayana we have the same. Samantha Bhakar says, jie wei xiao, right? Universally transfer everywhere. So make a wish. Tonight, being together at the Buddhist Gem Fellowship, what a joy. All this goodness I want to share with living beings. Who? Start with your mom. Start with your, with your relatives. Or start with your enemies, people who you're not liking so much this week, right? And dedicate merit to them. Here's the second half. There we go. And you send it, you say, dedicated to with the wish that. That's the full transference of merit. And because, think about this, where does my mind begin and yours need it? Where does my mind stop and yours begin? They don't. There are no fences in space between our minds. They mesh, just like light and light. So use that connection and dedicate merit. Send it out widely with the wish. Right? Beyond Malaysia. Send it out to Washington, D.C. Lord knows we need it. Right? Buddha knows we need it. Uh, but we're out of time. It's 10 o'clock. I don't want to go too late. So. Send out your dedication off the planet. I've heard the star Beetlejuice might be exploding soon. So send it out. Here we go. Let's... Make that wish, okay? Here we go. Those of you who know, sing loud. Yeah. 
Uh, brothers and sisters of Dhamma, before you leave, can you hide, kindly stack up the chairs so you can put it inside the story? And also, uh, remember the dear cookies downstairs.